I think we're set to go. Uh, the, I'm Michael Burns, uh, Chair of the uh, Moorhead Economic Development Authority. This is our meeting of June 29th, 2020, and I call this meeting to order. Uh, Amy, would you read the roll, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members present today include Nate Anderson, Michael Burns, Chad Coda, Zach Hiring, Pat Kovash, Joel Paulson, Larry Seljevold, Jeff Schauman, Bobby Soline, and Deb White. Also present include Derek LaPointe, Dan Molly, and Amy Thorpe. Derek, would you like to introduce our newest member, please? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So we do have a new member on the EDA. Uh, his first meeting is today, Joel Paulson. He is representing Moorhead Public Service. Uh, that is uh, Moorhead Public Service's appointment to the EDA board. So Joel obviously is a former city council member, uh, has a wealth of experience in, uh, in the city of Moorhead, um, currently works uh, with the diversion project. So we're excited to have uh, Joel, join us. Joel, I don't know if you want to say a couple words, but uh, happy to have you at your first meeting here virtually. Joel, if you can, uh, if you're muted if you're saying anything. <laughs> Might have some audio issues with Joel, but uh, we're we're happy to happy to have Joel, and uh, if we'll maybe get to another point, we're able to have Joel say a few words as well. So uh, I'll pass it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, are there any agenda amendments? None from staff. Members of the board. Hearing none, uh, we'll move forward. Um, Will uh, somebody move to approve the minutes from the May 18th meeting? Jeff White, move to approve. Is there a second? Zach Hiring, I'll second. second. There's a motion to approve and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all of fa in favor of approval say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Are there any citizens that care to address the board? We, uh, we do not have anybody calling in um, for any items outside of the agenda. Uh, I know Sherry Larson is on, but I think is gonna join Pat for the commissioner's report to just talk about the MBA. So there's nobody that has called in and nobody in the council chambers. Okay, thank you. Um, any Commissioner's reports. Pat, do you have anything? Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon, or I should say good morning. This is Sherry Larson with the Moorhead Business Association. And um, we are so excited for the biggest event in Moorhead, which is going to be our drive up and tune in to Bob 95 for the Moorhead Proud 5656 Ooh and Awe 4th of July celebration. The MBA has reached out to many businesses and these MBA members are opening up their parking lots for the community to view the spectacular display, such as the Moorhead American Legion, Bremer Bank, Sunset Lanes, Horizon and Dorothy Dobbs schools, the Cullen Hockey Center, Office Depot, Heralds on Main, Moorhead Career Academy, and many more. The fireworks will be launched from the Horizon Shore at approximately 1020. And just a reminder that the park will be closed to the public. And a big thank you to these major sponsors, American Crystal Sugar, Burlington Northern, Sanford Health, and Colbash Marine. The MBA are still looking for volunteers to help secure the blast zone area. And then on July 15th will be our fifth annual golf tournament. There is still time to register as an individual player or as a team. And thanks to Kobash Marine for the hole-in-one sponsorship. And at this time, we have 19 registered. This afternoon, we have our Moorhead Alliance for Nonprofits. We'll be meeting at the Horizon Shore Shelter at 4 p.m. This is designed for nonprofits. And our guest speaker today will be Matt with DonorDoc. Our Let's Talk Business Zoom meeting will be on Wednesday at 7 a.m. 
with Amy with the Healing Arts Revolution, and she'll be sharing her 5656 story. The Moorhead Business Association continues to share any updates from the city, state, and federal information on loans, grants, and guidelines, and that will continue to be on our website as well as our Facebook page. The Moorhead, or the MDA, also has created a Support Moorhead Restaurant Facebook page. This site was created less than a month ago, and we already have 900 followers that are following these Moorhead businesses, and approximately 4,000 comments, likes, and shares this last week. So please eat local, shop local, buy local, drink local, and enjoy local. We are all in this together, Moorhead proud and strong. Thank you. So yeah, just to add to that, I'd really like to, to uh, thank Nick and Sherry. They've been out there really working hard and, uh, and shaking the bushes. And um, you know, we still have some fundraising needs. Uh, we're, we're, we're working, we have 6,000 more that we need to raise for the fireworks. So if you know anybody out there, uh, uh, get them to get a hold of Sherry and, and let's get this event that identifies Moorhead funded. Thank you. Are there any further commissioner's reports? If there are none, um, Derek, I think I'm gonna let you introduce uh, Kevin and and talk a little bit about uh, the project that he's proposing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, today we have a Renaissance Zone application uh, from 913 LLC. Uh, Kevin Bartram is the representative and Kevin is on the phone today. Uh, after I kind of give a brief presentation, uh, Kevin will be able to fill in any gaps that I missed and obviously answer any questions you may have for the project. This is um, kind of phase two of the 913 lofts that are on Main Avenue. Uh, so we're talking directly to the south of, uh, of that existing property on Main Avenue. Uh, it's the construction of a, a new multifamily residential three-story uh, apartment building. Uh, there are walk-up apartments on the first floor, uh, and then obviously it, uh, it goes up three stories and, and accommodates some other units. There are parking on the first level too, enclosed parking. Uh, so there is um, uh, covered parking for the, the tenants there. Uh, Kevin has, has done a good job of, of just trying to scale back kind of some of this development as we're, we're kind of looking at single family homes to the south of this project. Uh, so they're kind of looking at design elements very keenly. Um, certainly this uh, it implements and continues to further our, our uh, objective of, of 500 housing units over the next five years in our downtown area, which was established in 2018. Uh, some of the you know, goals and objectives that uh, this project really hits on is obviously you know, an activity gener uh, generator, high quality housing. Uh, obviously we're, we're trying to get those, those individuals and more patrons living and, and working in downtown. Uh, enhances our kind of walkable districts, uh, urban design, uh, transportation network, and, and certainly infill with uh, uh, some, some truly kind of blighted properties that were on this, this uh, these few sites to, to create one large kind of newer project and ultimately increase the city's tax base. Uh, the zoning is commercial mixed use, MU3. Um, that does allow for a, a flexible approach to land uses uh, that has residential uh, and or commercial components with it. The total project investment right now is estimated to be about $4.9 million, which equates to an approximate uh, uh, cost per square foot of $177. That uh, in turn with our Renaissance Zone policy uh, qualifies this project for a 15 year property tax term. As a reminder uh, for our Renaissance Zone projects, the first five years of uh, an exemption, the land is always taxable, it remains taxable throughout the, the entire life of the incentive. But for the first five years, the new value is 100% uh, exempt. The next five years is 75%, and then the last five years would be 50% exempt. So we, we continue to see um, money come back to the city's, uh, city's kind of coffers after, after that first five years. Um, we have some you know, kind of breakdowns here. The, the timeline of this project, if, uh, if approved uh, here today, it would ultimately go to city council. Um, and if approved at city council, the project would begin in August of 2020 with an estimated completion of June 2021. Um, with that, 
Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I first maybe want to turn it over to Kevin to see if he has any further details he'd like to share uh, with this project. Kevin, are you on? Hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Kevin. Okay, uh, I guess I don't really have anything to add. Derek, you did a nice job explaining the project. I, I would uh, be willing, uh, happy to answer any questions that might come up. Great, thanks, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Um, we need a motion to move forward with this. Is there a motion to approve? Are, are we going to have discussion first? Um, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> we can, we can have it That's afterwards, too. <laughs> are there questions? Yeah, yes. Dan. Hey, uh, I'll, I'll go first. I didn't know if you saw my hand raised. Um, so first, uh, Mr. Bartram, I just want to thank you. And while we've got you on the call, I want to first congratulate you again on the great work that you did with the Simons Warehouse Project. And we had the, some of us had the opportunity to tour that. And what a great addition, uh, you know, really opportunity to breathe new life into that section of, of our downtown. Um, and I want to say, too, I really appreciate in this project that you are working on addressing some issues with some blighted property and really being mindful of the impact on the on the neighborhood. Um, and so my questions are really related to that. I just wanted to touch on a few things related to um, impact on the neighborhood. Uh, so my first question, I just wanted to confirm on the, in the designs we saw, there's no, we couldn't see the west side of the property other than the, some of the, um, in, in terms of the, the uh, designs of the building. Um, are there any balconies on the west side? Um, it doesn't look like it, but I wanted to confirm that. Kevin, I don't know if you could hear. about five feet, and, oh, and we uh, increased that uh, that setback distance a little bit just to provide a little buffer to the neighbor to the west. Uh, but other than uh, a few windows on the westmost unit, that's that's the only thing that faces west. No balconies. Great, that's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm. And then um, I like that you were really mindful of some of the design elements and thinking about how it could blend in with that older neighborhood. And I wondered, um, to me, when I look at it, it still looks very modern. And I, and I don't think you have to make something that looks like an old building, but I just wonder, you know, I think about, for instance, on 8th Street, um, the Comstock Commons building, I think is a great example of one that blends in really well. And even just some of the other small details, design elements that sort of fit with the neighborhood better. Um, in the picture, it looks like you have a lot more like blacks and grays. And I know in that area, if you think about Hornbachers and the St. Joseph's, there's a lot more of the red, brown brick. And I've wondered if you would, I just wanted to throw that out as a suggestion as maybe looking at some of those little details that may not change the cost a lot, but might help it blend in a little more. Um, I know in the Comstock Commons building, they also used the way they um, designed windows to make it look like that old multi-pane style. Um, so I was just going to put that as a suggestion of like of just looking at some of those smaller elements that really seem to make things fit in even better with the adjoining neighborhood. Um, I was wondering if there would be fencing on that west side of the property, and you already and you touched on setback, but will there be fencing on that west side of the property um, leading next to the single family homes? Um, at, at this point, there was no fencing that was planned. Uh, there's no access um, in and around that um, west side of the building, so we hadn't planned any fencing along there. But we do have fencing um, on the south side to create uh, patios for, for sort of front front uh, porch patios for each of the units that are on first floor. Mm -hmm. um, I think your comments about some of the materials and the colors are, are uh, excellent comments. We we still are finalizing uh, some of the final um, finish selections and a little bit of the detailing on the outside, particularly around the fence, the fencing, the landscaping, the, the first floor uh, uh, material all the way around the building. And, and uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I think there's some things that we can do there to, to um, accommodate some of those comments. Great, great. And then my last question was just in terms of the teardown for, so you you have three properties that you um, purchased that still have buildings. Do you, 
I know you're looking at August. Um, I know there had been some concern raised in the neighborhoods that there's people that have been getting in and uh, into some of those properties. Do you have an idea of how soon those could be removed? Um, actually, we're probably uh, going to start on some asbestos abatement uh, inside those buildings, maybe even as early as, uh, uh, I don't know if we can do it next week or if we have to wait until the council formally approves the Renaissance Zone, but uh, we're lining up the, the asbestos abatement work, um, so uh, construction would start on all three, the demolition of all three with that here in the next uh, couple of weeks. Fantastic. Great. That's my final question. Again, just thank you. I really appreciate the work that you've already done in Morehead, and I look forward to seeing this project go ahead. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Chad Coda, and I, I don't have a direct question on the project. I'll, um, I'll kind of echo Deb's comments and extend a thanks to Mr. Bartram related to his investment in Morehead and kind of our our continued plan with the Renaissance Zone, this checks a lot of those, um, you know, 505 boxes and things like that. So I uh, appreciate that. Maybe more of a question for Derek. I, I don't know I don't know if we do any sort of analysis on revenue generation, you know, pre-projects like this where we're kind of taking dilapidated real estate um, as far as what we expect to collect in the future related to existing property taxes and kind of the value and, and revenue generation from new projects like this. Um, I don't know if that's valuable information to review uh, in, in these types of situations. So maybe I'll just let Derek comment on that quick. Yeah, so what we what we try to do, um, we, I don't, we don't have the numbers obviously for the meeting today here, but what we try to do is work with our assessing department, obviously take what the existing values of, of we can, pull a public record of what the existing value were for those buildings. Uh, what we can initially do when these projects uh, come in is just have uh, the assessing department make an estimation of what that new tax value would be. Um, and they can kind of see that increment of what that new tax value would, would become. Uh, we don't have this analysis right the second, but, um, and certainly it obviously changes as, as the building is constructed. And, and obviously once the occupancy is there, we'll have a more concrete uh, assessment of it. But that is something that we're going to continue to track with our Renaissance Zone projects is looking at that increased value. It's something that we did in Fargo all the time. Um, I think Dan and I mentioned this quite a bit too. I think that downtown Fargo's value is about 300 million, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Now it's, you know, uh, 900 million. So there's, there's value that we can capture um, and that we'll continue to do that analysis. We just don't have obviously the concrete numbers for you today, but it is something that we are tracking. Perfect, thanks. Anything else, Chad? No? No. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Is there a motion to approve? I'll move for approval, uh, Coda. Thank you. Second, Anderson. Thank you. There's a motion to approve in a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, Amy, would you call a roll on this, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, Nate Anderson. Aye. Michael Burns. Aye. Chad Coda. Aye. Uh, Zach Hyrene. Aye. Pat Kovash. Aye. Joel Paulson. Aye. Larry Seljavold. Aye. Jeff Schauman. Jeff Schauman. Aye. Thank oh. you. Uh, Bobby Soline. Aye. Deb White. Aye. Thank you. Motion Thank you. passed. Motion passed. Thank you. Um, next item is uh, a legislative update from Lisa Bodie. Are you there, Lisa? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I was having some trouble with audio this morning. Um, the as, as many of you have probably followed in the newspapers and um, other news sources, 
The Minnesota legislature held a special session that began on June 11th and ended on June 20th and did not result in uh, a bonding bill, which was one of Moorhead's legislative priorities. And um, there's still uh, unfinished business. Um, the legislature's regular session adjourned on May 18th and it was disrupted by COVID-19 and remote meeting schedules. Um, Moorhead's goals for the session were to pass a bonding bill with a number of projects that we were trying to advance, and as well as um, getting the authority, the initial step um, in the process to ask voters to uh, possibly consider a sales tax for one or more capital expenditures in the, ninth, uh, in the 2022 election. So that process did not move forward and the bonding bill, uh, nor did the bonding bill. The, the proposals put forth though, did advance a couple of Moorhead's um, priority projects quite far so if there is another special session, those projects are well positioned. The, um, the Senate bonding bill that was, con that was considered during the special session included $8.5 million for the Clay County Transfer Station and $62 million for the 11th Street underpass. So um, we, we, we're, it's pure speculation at this point to know whether they will convene again this summer or whether that uh, bonding uh, bill will be put off until the 2021 legislative session. But those those projects are in in, uh, in the queue if, uh, if there is a bonding bill. The proposal also included $18 million for statewide flood mitigation efforts, which is not nearly as much as we had hoped for. It, um, because it is statewide, it would not address all of Moorhead's needs or that of the FM diversion. So we're disappointed in that. And uh, the proposals did not include funding for the Moorhead Community and Aquatic Center. Something else that we wished they would have done during the uh, special session was uh, distribute the Federal CARES Act funding for local governments. However, last Thursday, we did get word that the governor had approved the allocation that the legislative leaders had agreed to. So Moorhead will receive uh, three, almost $3.3 million of federal CARES funding. Now that CARES funding um, can be used for municipal needs as well as community needs, including loans to uh, businesses. And, or not loans, but perhaps grants. And um, we'll, we're in the process as a staff now, in, now that we have this, um, the, the approved allocation, we are in the process of meeting and determining what the city's municipal needs are that are eligible for CARES funding so that we know um, what additional resources might be available to um, distribute in other ways in the community. And there will be a short turnaround on this because the funds have to be allocated by November 15th or they revert to the county. And the spending deadline on those is December 30th of 2020. So this money is intended to be infused into the community as quickly as possible. And our staff um, collectively is working to accomplish that as soon as we can. So those are some of the the most recent issues, um, the, the governor is still offer, uh, operating under peacetime authority, emergency authority, and that authority has been extended um, to July 12th. So that might be an important date in knowing what happens, whether the legislature will reconvene or not, but it would be speculation. So. Um, a lot of this is is up in the air. We don't have definitive answers. It's, you know, it's been said it's a session like no others, and others have described it as as not accomplishing very much at all. Um, but we do still have hope for some of our projects, and um, I would, you know, it would be it's it's optimistic thinking, 
but it would be really nice if we uh, were able to see some of those bonding dollars approved and allocated to Moorhead yet in 2020, but it's very uncertain. Um, with that, I could probably attempt to answer any questions that any of the EDA members may have. Any questions? Silence means we'll move on. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, yes. Uh, I'll just say too, thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, there are a few items that'll probably pick up on the economic development report uh, with some of the uh, state um, resources that have been available and some of the issues that we face. So I'll, uh, I'll touch on a few things in the economic development report. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving uh, on to item number eight uh, related to the Makara in Industrial Park. Um, Derek, would you like to uh, share with us what you know about that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we have uh, actually just had a Makara review board at 1115 right before the EDA meeting here. So thank you to those uh, members uh, that were able to kind of double down, down some time today. Uh, what we have uh, for the EDA today is a recommendation for approval from the uh, from the Makara Review Board. This is looking at a expansion um, to the Springer Midwest building. Uh, this is, uh, as you may recall, we've actually at the last meeting that we had, uh, they came th came through with a proposed building. Uh, actually, it was a proposed use and a, a small expansion. Uh, they actually are looking to expand even further. So they're adding concrete uh, and asphalt uh, around their existing building, and then they're proposing a new building to the south of their building, uh, the existing building, uh, that would be used for onloading and offloading um, rail cars that come to the property. There uh, really are no issues um, from our, our board standpoint. There is a a question that we're still reviewing internally, which is the uh, building is within, proposed building is within the easement of the rail line. Uh, there's a 25 foot rail easement on either side of the track, so 50 feet in total. Uh, we've been working with Springer Midwest, working with the railroad company. Um, the railroad company does not have any issues with the building being closer to the railroad tracks. Um, but we, we have to find some internal um, guidance, uh, specifically from you know, city management and others on, on just what our preferred option is to, to discuss this with um, Springer Midwest management. So uh, again, it's uh, recommended for approval from the Makara Review Board for the expansion of a new building and added concrete around the existing site. Uh, if you have your screen up, Amy has the site plan. Uh, you can kind of get a sense for it. Um, and then as some history too, so the, the Makara review reviews the covenants of the industrial park. Uh, so any uses, uh, any expansions, um, and we are having conversations and the city attorney is um, being authorized to review the future role of the city in that um, Makara industrial park review board because most of that park is now uh, privately held, uh, and we've we've are going to look at some options of either removing the city of it or maybe putting some of these covenants into a zoning overlay so they still get reviewed at the planning level. Um, so there's some alternatives that we're working with Makara Review, Review Board on. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Derek. Questions. Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve? Deb White is to approve. Thank you, Deb. A second? Settles world second. Thank you, Larry. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, I guess I'll have you take the roll again for the vote, Amy. Thank you. Nate Anderson. Aye. Michael Burns. Aye. Chad Coda. Aye. Zach Irene. Aye. Pat Kovash.
Aye. <laughs> Joel Paulson. Aye. Larry Seljavold. Aye. Jeff Schaumann. Aye. Deb Saline. Uh, sorry, Bobby Saline. <laughs> Aye. And Deb White. Aye. Motion pass. Thank you. By the way, me, I'm on the call. Huh? I haven't been called yet. Oh, Alex, excuse me. Who? Alex. Is that... Oh, Alex. Alex. Kuzia. Kuzia. Sorry. Hey, I was also on the previous one, but you didn't call me, so I thought maybe naturally I counted. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, you, did you cast your vote then? I've been I've been on the on the on the line since uh, eleven fifty. So on the previous uh, vote, I wasn't called, so I remained quiet because I didn't know what was going on. But yeah, okay. just got me in for both of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let the record uh, show that Alex uh, Cusa entered the meeting at eleven fifty. He also um, voted aye on the Renaissance Zone. Kevin Bartram. Thank you. Um, Derek, would you like to talk a little bit about item B, the budget adjustment? Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, a maintenance quote that you see in your packet. So uh, Amy and I had an email from one of the uh, users in the industrial park that had uh, some concern about a, a section of track, uh, specifically kind of on the, the eastern side, or what, uh, sorry, western side of the track. Um, they were worried about some slumping that was in that area. Uh, ultimately, you know, Amy and I and other staff, we don't obviously use the rail line or, or don't rely on the rail on a daily basis. So we, um, we wanted to call Otter Tail Valley, the railroad company that kind of um, manages that section of track. Uh, they ultimately went out there and did an assessment of that section of track and found that um, there was some repairs that uh, were needed to make sure that um, uh, it was functioning properly and we had proper maintenance for long-term growth of, of the park. Um, that being said, there was uh, or should be some work that needs to be conducted to make sure we are adequate with our rail line. That cost of the service and maintenance is $900. So there's a couple different ways we could go about this. Uh, traditionally, I think you could special assess all the uh, rail users and, and users of the park for this maintenance. Uh, Amy and I, and having conversations with city leadership, thought based, of, based on the cost of this at, at $900, that this is something that um, the city uh, could assume through the EDA budget reserves uh, and or uh, through the, the budget calendar year. Uh, and just take care of this uh, maintenance issue for uh, for the track itself. Um, there may possibly be some larger repairs that need to be done at a future date. Uh, we still need to have a conversation with Otter Tail Valley about that. If um, those are substantial costs, I think we'd probably look to do a, a special assessment of some sort. But at this time, with this minor repair that was done at $900, um, we'd, be, we'd be looking for the EDA's approval on either um, assuming this through the, the calendar budget or uh, purchasing this through or, or spending this through the EDA reserves. So it's just standards maintenance that was drawn to the attention of, of Amy and I. Um, one thing I should note that I forgot, if the larger repairs, if Otter Tail Valley finds that there's larger repairs that need to be done, uh, what we would ask is that um, the existing rail users, those users on the track, that they would petition to have that repairs done. So nothing would just be done and then all of a sudden they just get a bill. Um, they would have to formally request obviously that maintenance and potentially assume any specials that may come with this. But again, that's a separate item that we don't have any further information on. Today we're just looking at that smaller maintenance uh, repair that was done for uh, $900. Be, Amy and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, this is Eldred, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, why do we have to pay for a railroad repair? 
So the railroad services the industrial park. Obviously, that uh, park has been utilized by a number of different users in the park. It is uh, a lot of city owned, and it's city owned. The actual easement and the way the, the tracks actually sit on is privately or is city owned uh, easement. So it is something that I think the uh, truly the maintenance and, and the long term kind of growth of the track is held by the city. It's not, it's, it's not privately uh, owned, and obviously we use Otter Tail Valley to manage it. Thank you. Any further questions? Is there I'm a motion? Mr. Chair, I have a question. question. Oh, yes. yes. I'll go after Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Uh, so to the extent we do pay the $900, when I get it, it's just 900 that's a lot of, it's a very small amount of money to assess. Can we, when the larger track repair does happen, can we recuperate that money through the larger assessment then? This is Dan Molly. I don't believe we can. That would be an, ex this is an expense, uh, ongoing maintenance repair that, that we'd have to take on now. Further questions? Sure, yes. Uh, so you mentioned, Derek, that we own the land that the line is, is on. And we also, don't we, um, for those properties that are connected to it, we're able to sell those at a higher price per urs where, you know, the, the land is a, charged at a higher price than ones that don't have access to the line. Too. So we also benefit from the sell property that is connected to it. Well, right. Yeah, so there's two lots, uh, two five-acre lots that have rail access. That's the only ones that are publicly held at, at this point in time. Um, and yes, compared to, obviously there's a price point for the ones along the interstate. There's a different one for, for the rail access. And then the cheapest one at this point in time is the ones at the very southern end of the park that don't have rail or interstate visibility. Okay. Hearing no further questions or comments. Derek, this is Kovash. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, for $900 and to have our staff have to go through the process of, you know, putting specials on and whatever, I think in this case, I think that's a better use of our, our city employees of paying the $900 and not having to go through this for the rail users. I, I will note too, thanks Pat. Um, I will note too that um, before my time, I think there was some other general maintenance that had been done on that, that track, not in the same area, but other portions of it that were minimal uh, expenses, you know, under $1,000 that again, instead of going through that special assessment process, um, the city covered that general maintenance of the track. Any further questions? Moving ahead, uh, is there a motion to approve this? Request? So moved, Kovash. Thank you. Second, Deb White. Motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion? Clarification. I, Mr. Chair, I think we'll need a clarification if we want to try to uh, use it to the calendar budget here or just use the EDA reserves. Uh, my, my motion was to use the EDA reserves, to use 900 in EDA reserves to just pay the bill. Deb, was your, that what your second was? Yes, yep, I support that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Thank you, Nate Anderson. Aye. Michael Burns. Aye. Chad Coda. Aye. Alex Cusa. Alex. Aye. Thank you. Did you Zach Hiring. I don't have a report there on the road. Pat Kovash. Okay. Aye. Joel Paulson. And and Ma'am Simpson. Aye. Larry Seljavold. Aye. 
Jeff Schaumann? Aye. Bobby Soline? Aye. Deb White? Aye. Thank you. Motion, Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Do you like to uh, go through the information about the Ener Enterprise Zone program, Amy? Absolutely. Let me grab my report here. Thank you. So the Enterprise Zone program has been in existence for um, close to probably 20, 20 or more years. Um, we've had legislation and law um, for border cities for probably 30 plus years. Um, so this is basically a annual um, event that we come in and bring this be, uh, before the board to you. Um, going through the report, you can see from um, last year, um, the number of businesses that are participating are approximately the same as, as year to year. And there's a, a chart in there that shows like the number of businesses and at what level they're participating at. You can see that um, of the 111 businesses participating in this program, there was close to $300,000 in credits ex expended. Um, further down the report, um, you see the um, health, housing with health-related services credits that were given. Um, these are for memory care and assisted living um, facilities that are in our area, which I think we can all agree that we're um, a very important part of, of the, the situation that we're facing right now. And then on the um, second page, you will see the account balance that we have. Um, we started the year at a little over a million dollars. This year in July um, starts our annual allocation, just over $500,000. So each year we will be getting that um, allocation. So we start the year off at about $1.7 million. And out of that, we take um, away uh, future credits that have been committed. So if we commit any um, uh, credits for uh, health-related services or future programs, we reserve them there. Um, we have reserved an, uh, uh, a significant amount for a high-value future project. Um, Derek and I do receive calls nearly weekly or every other week for some very, very high-value um, uh, businesses that may be coming to Moorhead, and um, we feel that that was that's a good uh, allocation of those funds is to uh, hold those in reserve. Some years it goes down; we don't hold as many, but we always hold those sort of credits in our head. This year, um, as I was going through um, and preparing my uh, report for you, I kept everything basically. Um, the same, you know, 20% credit uh, for workers' compensation, and the program would uh, expend approximately $300,000. However, I thought in amidst with, um, with our uh, current situation and with COVID and, and whatnot, that maybe our business community might uh, appreciate a little bump, at least maybe for one year. And so this morning, I um, did a, an analysis of what a 25% credit uh, with a $30,000 cap would mean to the program. And um, it, it looks to be like we would uh, increase the program amount by about $65,000. So $365,000 as opposed to approximately $300,000. Um, I, I think that we should entertain that as um, you know, our, our program can afford it. We're getting an allo annual allocation. And I think that our business community would really appreciate that gesture. Um, with that, I would entertain any questions or um, further comments. Any opinions on the uh, um, issue of increasing the percentage? from 20 to 25 percent for a single year to begin with? Uh, Amy, uh, oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, I'll wait, please. Oh, this is Chad. I was just going to say I, I kind of like the idea of doing a, a single year bump 
Um, appreciate you putting the work in to look look at that. The state allocation is there, so that's an annual allocation. Is there a, like a end date on that, or is that indefinite? Um, it's indefinite at this point. It is in law, um, thanks to Lisa and her um, work last year. We're we're receiving that benefit this year and going forward. I will say though that we're reviewing it all the time. Obviously, you never know what legislation is going to do, so they have their eyes on that every every session. Okay. All we can do is move forward with the information we have at hand. Um, so yeah, no, I, I like the idea uh, personally. Thank you. Jeff, you had a comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, so if I, if I do the math, that would be just under $600, that, that extra 5% would mean just under $600 per participant on average. So can you tell us of those 111 businesses, what the character of those businesses are. And the reason I say that is certainly some of our, you know, food and establishments and folks at retail establishments, they've been struggling more than, uh, say, more primary sector business. So what can you tell us about those 111 businesses, given we're really talking about less than $600 to kind of change the rule book? That's a great question, Jeff. So if you look on the first page on the business, um, the business uh, matrix, um, anything that you would see that's perhaps $5,000 in the credit range, $5,000 and up, I would say is a primary sector business um, or manufacturing in some way, um, also transportation and, um, yeah, transportation. So some of those smaller credits would be your um, businesses that would have less workers' compensation, um, offices, retail establishments, and oftentimes um, your restaurants will fall into there as well. So, um, you know, admittedly, it's probably not a huge um, benefit to restaurants particularly, but there's certainly room for thinking um, and, and maybe moving outside the box, creating something a little different. We have these care dollars coming up. We, you know, we have to, we have more discussion to do with that. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for that comment. I think um, it's, a, it's well taken. And I think where Amy uh, was just going with that too, with the federal CARES dollars that we will probably be having in relatively soon, the creation of, of programs that I mean, we have some local control finally over. Um, we can directly work with those that are that are really struggling, which is primarily the service sector, including restaurants, bars, et cetera. Um, so I think we'd have probably more flexibility um, to be able to work through that program or or I mean, at the desire of, of this group, maybe uh, try to get flexible with. Um, you know, with other dollars through the EDA, I know some groups across the state use uh, some of the loan fund money and some other things uh, to kind of help businesses. But it, there was a lot of state restrictions. Um, it was really hit and miss. A lot of them were loans. Um, and so they weren't really grants that, that truly people want right now. Um, and I'll get into a little bit with that in the economic development report. But even some of the deed programs that were coming out there, um, people weren't taking advantage of them because they just didn't want to take out another loan. It's, it's, a, it's a strange time, obviously, right now. Mr. Yeah, Chair, if I could just follow up on that, too, the, Jeff's question. So, Amy, the, you said the, you know, it would mostly apply to the ones that were below the $5,000 level, and that's the vast majority. It looks like there's only about a dozen that wouldn't, right? And, and I'm assuming that most of those then are smaller business that are probably locally owned, and so I think you know, um, that, that uh, you know, even if it's not a, a large amount of money for them, it could make a big difference and it sends a message about during a tough time that we're with them. Yes. Jeff, I, I thought I heard maybe you uh, try to jump in there again too. Jeff, did you have a follow up? Yeah, no, I certainly appreciate the discussion. I think, you know, as, as an economic development authority, we should be thinking of things we can do to help those businesses most impacted. Uh, and so in terms of, you know, 
spending dollars or offering dollars to entities that uh, are struggling, you know, I'm very supportive of that. My, my caution is that we're changing a program from 20 to 25 and next year potentially we're going back to 20. I think consistency is important when businesses try to expect and project things like workers' comp, right? And so, again, it's not about the dollars. I, I, I'm completely supportive of finding a way to help those service sector industries uh, in our community stay viable. Uh, and I, I wouldn't vote against the emotion, but you know, I just want to note that I think there might be better uses where we can target those dollars to those uh, service industries in our community. Other comments? Mike, yes. this is Cole Bosch. Yep. I, uh, I, uh, you know, there, this program has always been kind of up and down and inconsistent. So I think striving for consistency on this, you know, with the way our funding mecha mechanism was, it never really had it. Um, you know, it's we have a, we have a lot of money there, okay, and we're looking for this funding. And I also think that people can look at the state and 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 us as Moorhead and say, well, God, why do we need to give them more funding when they're not using it? So you can kind of look at it the other way. And I don't I think at sixty five thousand dollars and a little bit, to, you know, I mean, I would I, I wouldn't even apply for it. If, you know, I mean, I because I receive it. So I don't know if I have to abstain or not. But I just think it sends a message to the business community that we're looking at them. Yeah, I share share your position, uh, Pat, on that. Since I'm a business owner as well, and have uh, used the program ever since I relocated the office to Moorhead in 1989. So, but I like the idea of increasing. The amount, uh, un because of the special circumstances we've all in endured this year. So, all right. Any other comments? May I just ask: Is is John Shockley on the call? I don't. I see his yep, name. Yep, John up there. Shockley is on the call. I can just say that um, for as I'm, long as I'm I've here. been. Okay, John, we just had a, um, a question about whether or not business owners would need to um, recuse themselves of, of um, voting on this matter if, if we're voting to increase. I was just going to comment, though, that I don't believe we've ever done that before. No, I mean, as long as it's applicable across all businesses and it's not specific to one single business, you would not have to abstain as a, just a general Moorhead business owner. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. All right, uh, we need uh, a motion for direction. And uh, is there anyone care to make a motion? I'll move to approve the 25% Kovash. Thanks. Paul second. Sinnoh, second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Amy, would you read the roll again, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Nate Anderson. Aye. Michael Burns. Aye. Chad Coda. Aye. Alex Cusa. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Zach Hiring. Aye. Pat Kovash. Aye. Joel Paulson. Aye. Larry Seljavold. Aye. Jeff Schaumann. Aye. Bobby Soline. Aye. Deb White. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Um, all right, Derek, uh, on to your economic development report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, again, I may go a little off cuff here, too, just because I, I think it's just important just to speak just freely about uh, what's going on. Obviously, um, lots have been happening even since the last time we had conversations here as an EDA. Uh, we continue to, to try to uh, best serve our businesses' needs and their questions that they have. Um, 
as Jeff, you know, pointed out, and he's he's spot on. The service industry is the one that's really taken the the biggest beating out of this whole uh, whole pandemic. Um, that includes hospitality, um, hotels, uh, restaurants, retail, uh, you name it. Uh, the the border cities uh, challenges remain and and still are probably probably some of the most prominent challenges that we face, especially since. You know, North Dakota opened on May 1st, and I think the majority of our restaurants uh, started opening on June 15th. So, a uh, month and a half, give or take, of of uh, being being really put back at a disadvantage from from those that were just across the river. Um, phase three is is the current phase of the sa Stay Safe Plan um, in Minnesota. That's what we're in right now. Um, hearing from many state leaders. I don't think there's really um, any timetable set up right now that's that's going to push us into the next phase. The next phase phase really includes uh, larger gatherings, um, further uh, occupancy um, easement, like ease on on how many you can have in the restaurants. Right now, it's 50% occupancy inside. Uh, we did act pretty quickly to allow for outdoor dining when that was the only option that a lot of our restaurants had. We uh, allowed for, for those restaurants to uh, serve in their parking lots, um, get a temporary use agreement from the city to be in public right away, like sidewalks or uh, parking lots. Um, so we've been, we've been trying to coordinate as best we can with them. Um, but overall, there's, uh, there's a lot to still be, be done. Uh, the assistance programs that we, we just talked about briefly here of, of local, obviously there's federal, state, and, and local programs. Most recently, the state of Minnesota created the Small Business Relief Fund uh, or Relief Grants. Uh, it was a new program. Uh, qualified businesses can apply up for grants up to $10,000. Um, can be used for rent and payroll, utilities, uh, the challenge with this particular grant is that uh, the awardees are randomly selected via a computer-generated lottery system. And we started hearing from many of our business owners uh, that were deemed ineligible uh, to get in even to that lottery system because there was a, a requirement that mandated that uh, majority ownership be uh, residents of Minnesota. Uh, as you can imagine, again, on the border, uh, we have many great businesses that pay Minnesota taxes, um, but they may happen to live in, in our neighboring state. Um, and they're struggling, it could not even apply for it, which was very difficult um, to kind of pass along. We had conversations with our local legislators, state leadership, um, really kind of drew the attention on that. And I don't necessarily think it's only a border issue because uh, I know there's many restaurant owners or business owners in Detroit Lakes and Fergus Falls that have North Dakota residents or uh, even, you know, to Duluth and Superior, so the North Dakota or uh, Wisconsin and, and Minnesota border. Um, it was more of a statewide issue than really just a border issue. The, the answers we got back was one, uh, the requirement for residency was, was in state law. So that could not be changed unless they went back to special session and changed the state law. So that was uh, something that they, they can't change administratively. Um, and the other comments that I've been receiving from our local legislators and state leadership is that because there was a limited amount of funds, there was $62 million uh, in this fund, $31 million was designated for Greater Minnesota. Because there was limited amount of funds, they felt by opening this up too freely, um, they just couldn't couldn't uh, spread that money around to be impactful. Um, we have been working with the local legislators and state leadership, though, to ensure that that requirement does not get passed along to uh, the federal CARES allocation, the, the money that Lisa and, and we've had other conversations throughout this meeting on. We don't want that same requirement because if we can create local programs, um, we certainly want to be able to serve those that truly need help. Um, again, good people, uh, good Minnesota businesses, uh, they shouldn't be penalized for, for living a, a stone's throw away 
um, when they actually have you know roots in the, with their businesses in Minnesota and paying Minnesota taxes. So um, we're hearing the latest number is a little over three million dollars that will be coming into that um, from that federal CARES dollars for local governments. Um, city manager, acting city manager Dan Molly, um, is having a little bit of a internal uh, review group. Um, I'm sure we'll be probably looking at including some external folks, uh, maybe even some folks from the EDA uh, that have a desire to sit on uh, some type of uh, task force to figure out how we best allocate those dollars to businesses that need help. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, the, the biggest challenge with those dollars is how quickly we need to spend it. Um, they cannot be used in an existing program, so it has to be a newly created program. Um, so we're talking about establishing a program, um, receiving applications, and then ultimately distributing the funds by December 30th. And that's going to that's going to be quick. That's going to be a really quick turnaround. Um, the other challenge that I'll just say with this too is, and I know we want to serve the people that that truly need the help. Um, but it's the same issues that the federal uh, government's having and the state government's having. They're getting absorbent amount of phone calls, uh, applications, and just the process of reviewing that uh, is so significant that um, it's, almost, it's almost not feasible for, for state and, and federal governments to accomplish. So our process of how we distribute these funds and the program that we create, we really have to be mindful of uh, of that review process and, and what that uh, program entails to to make sure that we can handle the amount of applications and the amount of phone calls that we're going to get on top of trying to keep up with uh, the the continuous uh, flood of just business requests and inquiries of of uh, assistance that they need so there's a lot to to come about with that and um, we're kicking around a lot of ideas um, that can really be the the biggest bang for for uh, how quick of a time frame that we have. Um, I'll just be quick with all the other stuff, but um, the downtown master plan. We're currently in phase three of four, um, working with Stantec. Obviously, um, I did want to draw some attention because I know it was in the media over the last few weeks about the Woodlawn Point site, the former power plant site. Uh, that's uh, request for qualifications, the RFQ, um, was designated in the scope of work that was um, put in place for the downtown master plan. That was something that obviously the downtown Moorhead Inc. board uh, authorized the EDA and the council. So we had that as a scope of work. Uh, it took a lot of public engagement of what could become on that site. Ultimately, we, we drafted uh, an RFQ um, and the council is now determining whether or not they would like to proceed with, uh, with doing an RFQ and then ultimately an RFP for uh, development inquiries. Um, there's a couple points of confusion that I just want to clarify because it was, it was um, it, we were getting lots of questions on it. The, the city is not um, selling the park. <laughs> uh, the forum had that out there too that the um, the park was being sold. This is the former power plant site. It's not um, designated or dedicated to be park land. Um, this was a, a former uh, power plant site um, that was potentially identified as a, a redevelopment site. But ultimately, the city council will make that determination if they would like to proceed with, uh, with any type of RFP, RFQ process for uh, receiving development inquiries. So I just wanted to clear that up because I'm sure uh, many of you saw that in the paper. Um, the other stuff I'll just kind of let you uh, read through and if you have any questions, um, certainly certainly I'll be a try, try to answer them for you. But I'm assuming there may be some questions on just the uh, maybe the, the RFQ for, for the Woodlawn site and certainly some of the COVID-19 state and federal um, well, just resources and, and changes that have, have happened since our last meeting. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments that the group may have. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll make a comment. Derek, uh, thank you for, for just talking a little bit about the Woodlawn Point site. And I do think it was, it was valuable to get some information out there. There was a lot of confusion about it. and. Um, 
think it's just a good reminder to folks that you know there are opportunities for community input. We really value that, and I think I think um, you've gone out of your way with the working with Stantec to ensure that we do get community input. But just uh, there's still plenty of opportunity for that to happen, and um, right now, as you know, as you mentioned. Um, we're only at the very beginning stages with this RFQ and um, in the conversation that we've been having is that the way that that's being drafted is very much based on community. So, um, you know, I think people thought that we were much farther along in the process than we were. It really is something we want to be a reflection of the interests of the, of the community. So, so I appreciate you um, shedding some light on that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Is there any kind of uh, a time frame that you have in mind uh, for getting this out and in the future? You know, I'll just say, so right now we're, we're still trying to make sure we have all the elements of the RFQ. Um, ultimately, what will end up probably happening is we'll send this draft RFQ to the city council members, because uh, I know many of them had uh, ideas or components that they'd like to see within that RFQ. Um, my hope would be if we can come to a consensus or at least the council uh, provides some, some internal direction that maybe we would be having that further discussion in the end of June uh, at a city council meeting and that's where they would ultimately make the determination if they're, um, if we're proceeding with a public inquiry for RFQ or, or not. Um, you know, if RFQ is uh, posted, uh, my guess would be we would have it live for between 30 and 45 days, give or take. Um, you know, again, getting ahead of myself, but I think it's important for people to know. Um, so if we're at 30, 45 days for, for that, we'd ultimately convene again. We'd have a RFP drafted, get that guidance, and go live with something with that to the probably two or four development groups that would be selected through that RFQ process. Uh, and the reason why we decided to go that route was we we've, we've have had a lot of inquiries on this property in particular. Uh, we knew we would have um, some qualified folks that would be coming in too, but we really want to see that experience. I think the council will want to see that experience that could translate to that type of site. Um, and then if we can narrow it down to, you know, two to four, developers, I think the RFPs that we would ultimately get would be very high quality and I think we would see more investment from those development groups to really showcase a, progress, a project that um, we could ultimately decide if, if uh, it's, it's worth proceeding with or not. Thank you. Is that a, uh, an official brownfield site or is it not? I don't believe it is. Um, I could be wrong on that, though. I don't think it is. I know a lot of its assessments was uh, done with that with our uh, city assessor, Pete, and um, I know there's a lot of records on it, but I don't know if it's officially designated as a brownfield site. Thanks. Mike, I'd just like to make a statement. This yes. is Cole. Um, I, I really think that you guys getting moving on this in a in a fast manner is a really good thing. There's a lot of low interest money out there. And you know, even though some, some of these developers have been affected by COVID on some of their commercial and residential properties, um, the ones that I've been talking to still are interested in moving forward with their plants. So, you know, there's cheap money out there and for us to get our ducks in a row and be able to find a developer, uh, I think it's a good time and we need, we need to do it quickly. That's a good point. All right, any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have one question for Mr. LaPointe, if I may. Yes, please. Um, Derek, you mentioned the rules and regulations for the CARES, federal CARES dollars. Um, so do those dollars come through a state agency then, or are they allocated directly to the city of Moorhead? Yeah, so Dan, uh, Dan Molly probably has a little bit more of the direct route on how the funding will get to the city. Yeah, uh, Joel, we've been hearing from the State Department of Treasury on this so far, so through the state, and we just started getting the, the notices in the last week. And so we're actually meeting this afternoon to start structuring what next looks like, because we're gonna be on a pretty quick timeline here. And we certainly will be in touch with the Economic Development Authority. 
Sounds great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, let's... Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just say too, if you have any questions, um, or if you hear of businesses that need help or just tracking the right information, Amy and I are on this, uh, <laughs> I mean, 24-7. We There's really no work day anymore. It's it's around the clock trying to trying to point these folks into the right direction and, and, uh, and tap them into resources. Because you know, even to Jeff's point earlier too about impacting those, you know, service restaurants, even Amy and I were reading too, like there may be dollars being designated out of the, the state and federal level that could be directly towards, you know, restaurants. So this this is so, um, it's, it's so evolving quickly that it's almost uh, mind boggling to kind of keep up with. But uh, if people just need help or just unsure of where to go with things, um, we're here 100% uh, behind our businesses to, to try to help them any way we can. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Okay, let's move ahead uh, uh, to item number 11A. Um, Dan, would you like to share a, a little bit of information about this, please? Certainly, I'd be happy to, and I, and I promise to be brief. I know we're, we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, I just want to um, open by saying that I'm Dan Molly, the acting city manager as of today. Uh, the mayor and council have asked me to serve in this role over the last um, couple of, or over the next couple of months, and um, as it seeks a permanent city manager. And, uh, Boy, I enter this with humility. <laughs> um, you know, if I were to ask you of anything, I guess I'll just break the establishment clause. Please pray for me. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, but no, it's really great to be part of this robust conversation. It's great to see all of these, you know, talking about what is possible, what we need to do together rather than what's happening in a lot of communities where there's really a lot of hardship and pain and struggle and, and confusion. This is very optimistic and a positive conversation today, especially around businesses and their economic development and uh, in our community. And it's really, really great that we could have this conversation for even over an hour. But I want to say, um, coming ahead, uh, we're working on the budget. And we're going to be back next month with, um, so right now staff's preparing the requests and everything else. We'll be back with the preliminary budget uh, uh, and levy request next month in August and give that time between August and September for you to review and then we'll bring uh, we'll be back in September asking for the EDA to approve the preliminary budget. Um, this will be the maximum that that can be levied for economic development activities in Moorhead so we could always lower it we just can't raise it any higher than what we set in September. Over October and November we'll be able to review the funds, talk more, um, whatever we need to do and then sometime between november 25th and december 28th we will ask that a final budget be approved so that's kind of what the the budget timeline looks and what to expect next month all right anything else no thanks for having us <laughs> yeah thanks for being here mm -hmm. and congratulations on your new role thank you mike you're welcome uh any other comments before we uh, adjourn. Uh, I just wanna point out item number B regarding the building permit valuation uh, report is available online for anybody that's interested. But beyond that, any other comments? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone. <laughs>